Today, we'll be talking about a visitation at 3 a.m., an extremely haunted house, a ghost in a school bus, and much more. All coming up on this episode of Paranormal Mysteries. Thank you for joining me and welcome. I am your host as always, Nick Ryan. I hope you've all had a great week, and before we start today's episode, I'd like to thank Quinn for their support and generosity. And if you enjoy the show, please consider following, sharing, and reviewing the podcast. This supports us by helping new listeners to discover the show. You can also support us by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash paranormalmysteries, or by donating at buymeacoffee.com slash paranormal. And if you'd like to share your paranormal encounter on the podcast, you can write to me at paranormalmysteriespodcast at gmail.com or by visiting our website at paranormalmysteriespodcast.com. Or if you prefer to record your experience and send it in, you can now do this on our website as well. You can also visit us at speakpipe.com slash paranormalmysteries and record your story there. And don't forget, all these links can be found in the show notes. And with all that in mind, today's first story comes to us from Arlie, and Arlie's story is called Bunny, the White Dog. Arlie says, Hey Nick, I want to say thank you for sharing my other story. Honestly, thank you. The story I'm about to share contains details in regards to a sensitive topic, animal cruelty. Where I live, the neighbors lost their home during the recession. A bank bought the home and rented it to different people, so we would see new families come and go about every month, until we got a new neighbor that actually liked the place and stayed for two years. He would have parties almost every weekend, and we wouldn't mind because our home was soundproof. In this story, I will call him Monty, not to confuse the listeners. One cloudy, misty Sunday morning, police officers knocked at our front door. They were investigating a shooting that involved our new neighbor, Monty had had a party and fought with some other neighbors who were gang members down the block, and Monty's friend killed one of the problematic gang members. A couple days passed and we found out that the person they killed had a very vengeful brother, and he was trying to kill Monty. We were asked not to share any information in regards to Monty's whereabouts. The cops asked Monty to move out for his own safety, and for the bank also not to rent the house for a couple of months. I guess so the new people would not be harassed or harmed by this vengeful gang member. During this time, the house was alone, so my doggies loved going to this house to chill and do their business. We had to constantly go over, bring them back, and scold them. On one of these days, we were looking for Bunny, and we couldn't find her. We then looked over the fence and found her lying flat in front of the abandoned home. She was left like a death warning to the homeowner, Monty. Some people do this especially to the owner's animals, and they may have thought that Bunny belonged to the neighbor. While my sister and I were cleaning her remains, that vengeful person came by and said, Do you know where the party happened? They killed my brother. We pointed to the house behind us. He then said, And where do you live? And we pointed to our home on the other side. We explained to him that we were just there picking up our doggy, Bunny. He then told us to be careful while showing us a knife, and he then looked down at Bunny. I then realized he might have been the one who had killed Bunny. We buried Bunny in our own backyard and we let it be, as we were so young and helpless, and the cops wouldn't come to help us as we had no proof of who hurt her. After a couple of days while grieving for Bunny, we would randomly see a white dog passing by. Was it Bunny? We believe we saw Bunny's spirit. My brother saw her when he was feeding our other dogs. She came to the plates like she was going to eat. This scared him and he dropped the plates and ran into the house. I saw her when I was taking out my laundry in the little back room. She did her normal zoomies that she loved to do in the backyard, just like how we played while I was in there. I believe due to her traumatic death, she might have not understood what happened to her. She might have been trying to interact with us as we were quite sad about her death and of what happened to her. So on her grave I put a little cross, I prayed a little more, I asked her to go in peace, and I told her I was sorry for what had happened to her, and that we would be okay. 
after which we didn't see her again. I apologize if this was long, but I do really appreciate yours and everyone's time. Please, you and your team, take care. Our next story comes to us from Sean, and Sean's story is called, Mom Says It's a Good Ghost. Sean says, This is a true story that I've been sitting on for about 22 years now. I've told it many times, but I've never written it down, and I figured this is probably the best place to share it. I'm going to change the names of the family to protect their identities, but everything that happened in this story is real. When I was in elementary school, I spent a lot of time over at my friend Mark's house, and it was straight up haunted. We lived in a nice suburban area of Savannah, Georgia, in houses that were constructed in the 1970s. Mark and his family moved to our town when we were in the second grade, right around 1991, so it wasn't like he lived in an old creepy house or anything, but it truly had paranormal activity going on in it. Nothing about the previous occupants is known, but when Mark's family moved into the house, they found this exceptionally creepy Ouija board in the unfinished basement. It was wedged between the built-in workbench and the wall. They didn't discover it until a few weeks after they were getting settled in. It wasn't something that was store-bought, and I remember even as a kid thinking that, one, it was one of the creepiest things I'd seen in person, and two, a lot of time and care went into making it. It was constructed of a circular piece of wood with about two feet of circumference. The English alphabet and numbers 0 through 9 had been carved into it with some sort of burning tool. In the background of the entire thing was a pentacle. Occasionally, we'd bring it out and play with it. We'd be over there at a sleepover with four or five of us moving a glass around, saying stuff like, I would like to speak with the ghost of Abraham Lincoln. We were just a bunch of stupid kids possibly letting something terrible into the house, by no means helping anything. The first time I saw something noticeably strange was during my second or third time over at Mark's house. I was walking by his bathroom on my way from the living room into the kitchen when the toilet suddenly flushed by itself. I remembered that I wasn't particularly frightened, but I stopped in my tracks and said, Hey man, your toilet just flushed by itself. And he responded, Yeah. Our house is haunted, but don't worry, my mom says it's a good ghost. Just to clarify, this wasn't an automated urinal or something. This was an ordinary house toilet in 1993. There's no reason it would suddenly flush by itself. The second time I clearly saw something strange happening was when we had taken the bus home one Wednesday afternoon and we let ourselves into Mark's house. He and I were both pretty much latchkey kids. His mom and dad had jobs that kept them out until 4 p.m. or 5 p.m. on most weekdays, and on Wednesdays his older brother, Dan, had an after-school club that he'd go to. So it was just the dog, Sydney in the house for a few hours after school and us. I remember coming into Mark's house, dropping our book bags off in the kitchen, and taking the dog out to do her business. When we came back in, and this is the part that stands out to me, I remember reaching for a banana in the fruit basket next to the toaster, which was on the kitchen counter. On the other side of the toaster, there was a loaf of Wonder Bread, and it was at least a foot away from the edge of the counter. I don't know why I noticed it at the time, but I did. Then, Mark and I went into the living room, and after about five minutes of watching TV, there was suddenly this loud bang that came from the kitchen. It sounded like a heavy phone book had been dropped onto the tiled floor. At first, I thought the dog had gotten into something, but when I looked, the dog was next to us with her ears perked up. She looked alert and worried. We walked into the kitchen and found the loaf of bread in the middle of the floor as if someone had picked it up and slammed it on the ground. I remember thinking it was strange, but it wasn't alarming enough to bring to an adult's attention. I mean, what was I going to say? Hey, your toilet flushed and a loaf of bread fell on the floor by itself and made an unusually loud noise? But then, something strange enough did happen that made me bring it up to Mark's mom. A few weeks later, Mark and I were in his room on the second floor, and we heard his mom's hairdryer turning on and off repeatedly. It would turn on for about two seconds, and then flick off for two seconds. His mom was not in the house at the time, because she had gone to the grocery store, so we thought it must be his brother trying to dry something. After a few minutes of this, we got annoyed enough to walk down the hall and see what was going on. When we walked into the bathroom, the hairdryer was flipping itself on and off. 
I remember being pretty freaked out by this because it was like seeing an invisible thumb flicking the on and off switch. But Mark casually reached up and unplugged it, and it stopped. We convinced ourselves it was just an electrical malfunction, but I've never seen anything like that before or after, and even though I shrugged it off, it stuck with me. One day over lunch, I decided to bring up the weird things I had heard about and seen to Mark's mom. After all, he said that his mom thought it was a good ghost. Yes, it is a good ghost, she confirmed. She then said, I remember one time I was carrying a load of laundry up the stairs and I lost my footing. I thought that Dan was behind me because I swear I heard him coming up the stairs and he caught me and pushed me back up. But when I got to the top, I turned around and there was no one there. She also told me that sometimes things would go missing and then show up in plain sight a few days later. And she said this, This one time I took my wedding ring off when I was making dinner. I clearly remember putting it on a ring holder I keep on the shelf above the sink. When I was done making dinner, I turned around to put my ring back on, and it was gone. I remember being so upset and thinking that one of the kids might have taken it. I believed them when they said that they hadn't touched it, because, well, why would they, right? I thought maybe it had somehow been knocked into the sink, but it didn't make sense, and I was the only one who had been in the kitchen until dinner was ready. It was bizarre. But three days later, I was coming down the stairs, and there it was, sitting on the cabinet by the door. When I asked everyone, thinking maybe my husband or my kids had found it on the floor, no one in the house knew how it had gotten there. She then took a sip of her tea, and her eyes lit up, and she said, Oh, and this one's really good. One time, shortly after we had moved in, we went out for dinner. When we came home, every light in the entire house was on, even the desk lamps and attic light. I believe it was because someone was trying to break in, and it turned the lights on to scare them off. So to answer your question, yes, it is a good ghost, and there's no reason to be afraid of it. Anyway, time went on. I don't remember much else besides the footsteps upstairs that we'd occasionally hear when we were the only people in the house, or light switches being turned on when we knew we had turned them off. Hanging out at Mark's house was my normal after-school routine. Honestly, if this one major incident hadn't happened, I probably wouldn't even remember that this house was haunted. Up until what I consider to be the grand finale, the haunting was just a few small happenings that couldn't easily be explained away. However, then the incident occurred, and it's a moment I'll remember for the rest of my life. It is the reason that I entirely believe in ghosts, spirits, and demons. It was one of the last times I went to Mark's house. In fact, it was the last time I went to his house, because I refused to go back. It was a summer day in 1994. I had finished 6th grade, and I was 12 years old. Mark's dad had just brought home a Pentium with a spaceship racing game on it. It was probably about 2 in the afternoon, because I remember that Mark's parents were both at work, and his brother had gone to a friend's house. It was just us and the dog in the house, and Mark and I were down in the big open basement, talking about how we'd spend the rest of our afternoon. Let's play the new spaceship racing game, I said. Nah, I think we should go to the pool, Mark said. Dude, I don't want to go to the pool. This new game is awesome, and I want to play it. Then Mark became uncharacteristically hostile. He swore at me and said, I'm going to the pool. I remember when he said that, it struck me as strange, because Mark and I rarely argued, and I'd never seen him lose it like this over something so simple. Fine, go. Whatever, man, I'm staying here, I yelled back. Mark then stormed upstairs. I heard him cross the living room, go up the stairs to the second floor, and slam his bedroom door. After a few minutes, I heard the faint sound of the garage door screech open, and then close again, and Mark was gone. At this point, I was in the house and in the basement, all alone, except for the dog who was somewhere upstairs. I had turned on the big, azure-white Pentium Tower ten minutes beforehand, so it was nearly at the Windows screen. Just as it finished loading up Windows NT, I heard a sound I will never forget above me. The sound still haunts my dreams to this day. The best way I can describe what happened next is a play-by-play. -play. I was just about to click on the game's icon when I suddenly heard the rocking chair directly above me rock back and forth several times. At first I thought it was Mark playing a trick on me, or maybe the dog getting up to go look out of the front window. But then I heard heavy footsteps walk across the floor and stop at the basement door. 
A second later, the door swung wide open and then shut violently. It must be Mark. He's trying to get me to go swimming with him, I thought. I heard angry footsteps rush down the stairs. The problem was, the stairs were empty. The basement had a floating wall with a 5 by 5 window where I should have seen someone, anyone, coming down those stairs. But there was no one. It's just the dog. It's Sydney freaking me out, I thought. But the pounding phantom footsteps were still coming. They hit the bottom of the stairs and ran across the shag carpet, leaving large, deep impressions with each defining step. My veins turned to ice. Up to this point, I had spent hundreds of hours between the 4th and the 6th grade in this basement. We played in there, we watched movies, and had sleepovers down there, and I swear to God, nothing like this ever happened before. The footsteps raced through the shag carpet to the utility room door, which was about 15 feet straight ahead of where I was sitting. The door was slightly ajar, and it banged open like somebody had just punched it. It shook open, and from within the utility room erupted the most sinister, horrible laughter I've ever heard in my life. It was deep and unnatural. It was like listening to someone laughing through a megaphone. Each laugh got louder and louder, so loud it made the windows next to me rattle. And at this point, I stood up and ran. I've never run as fast in my life as I did in that moment. I bolted up the stairs and out of the kitchen door, and all the way to the top of the driveway. I was breathing better by then, relieved to be outside and no longer alone in that house with that thing. But I hadn't been alone. Oh God, the dog was in there too, I realized. I have to go back. I can't leave her in there. I ran back and kicked open the kitchen door and started screaming. Sydney, come on girl, let's go. She came around the corner and I grabbed her by the collar and dragged her out to the driveway. There was no way I was going back into that house, all the way to the laundry room, just to get her leash. Sydney and I jogged in the hot afternoon sun to the pool where Mark was swimming, me holding her collar the whole time. There, I tried to explain to him what had happened. I told him about the horrible pounding footsteps, the phantom footprints, and the sinister laughter. Yeah, man, my house is haunted. You knew that, he said in a hushed matter-of-fact whisper. But his words couldn't console me. That was the most haunting and terrible thing I had ever seen in my young life. I remember sitting outside the pool holding on to Sydney's collar for several hours while Mark swam. I remember trying to explain to the other kids in the neighborhood during the adult swim session about what I had seen and no one knowing what to say. I specifically remember when I tried to tell Mark's parents and my mom what had happened and they all waved it off as my imagination or tried to explain that it could have been the wind. Even though Mark's mom seemed understanding, it wasn't enough. I never went back to Mark's house. We grew apart in later years, but ever since that sunny summer afternoon in that relatively peaceful house, I have always believed in ghosts, especially that one I most certainly did not think was good. Our next story comes to us from Grimmy, and Grimmy's story is called Small Paranormal Activity. Grimmy says, So this is more of two paranormal experiences in one telling. So when I was younger, I lived on a farm located somewhere in the Ohio countryside. In the forest surrounding the house, there stood this old broken down and plant brushed bus. It was really old. I knew that it was old due to how the interior was set up. It wasn't like the other school buses around that area. So one day, my friends, well, my cousins and I, decided to go exploring, and we came across this bus, and being the children that we were, we thought it was an amazing idea to explore it. Nothing happened the first few times around, and we went to the bus quite a lot, mostly during the hot summer days, and I believe we found it during the last week of that school year. Nothing seemed to happen, not until we all played hide-and-seek. When I was one of the hiders, I climbed up and hid in this large oak tree of sorts. From my perch in the tree, I thought I saw a figure emerge from the bus. It didn't look like anyone I knew, and it for sure wasn't any of my cousins. So, who was it? When it was my turn to be the seeker, I started to look around for the others. I don't know why, but for some reason I felt sort of drawn toward the bus, like I just had to go and look around the bus for some reason. So I did. I looked around the land near the bus and ended up seeing one of my cousins from across the pond that stood about 20 to 25 feet away from it. But I decided to go and check out the bus, and when I walked into it, everything was fine. But after staring for a while longer, I noticed that things had moved. 
the large heavy tire that my cousins had seen on the right side of the bus seemed to now be on the left side of it, but I thought nothing of it. It wasn't until I looked out the window towards the back of the bus that I saw the same dark figure in the woods, just about 10 feet from the bus. I was a kid, so naturally I was both scared and curious, but mostly scared. So I ran from the bus and came half crying to my cousins. They then calmed me down, and we both went back to the bus together. But there was nothing. I don't know if I had seen things, or if it was actually there or not, but I know what I saw. Well, sort of. It was sort of just large, maybe the size of an average-sized person, but it was tall compared to me at the time. I still saw it from time to time, but I refused to go back to that bus by myself, unless I had someone with me. My second paranormal experience is more recent. To be short, I think my house has a ghost who likes to pull my leg from time to time. I'll put something on a shelf far enough back that it won't fall down, and guess what happens? I'll be sitting down reading or something, and that same object just falls from the middle of the shelf. It's not as scary as the bus story, but it is still a little annoying. Our next story of the night comes to us from Andy, and Andy's story is called A Knock at 3 a.m. Andy says, I recently began listening to your podcast during my free time. At first, I did not consider submitting a story. However, my friends encouraged me to, so here it is. I believe strongly in the paranormal, and I have had several encounters with it, but never as close as this. I went to sleep around 11 p.m. and locked my door, making sure it was completely closed since I don't like to sleep with my door open towards the dark hall. My parents and sister were already asleep in their rooms, and around 3 a.m., I suddenly woke up feeling uneasy and found my door completely open at 90 degrees. My door makes plenty of noise when it's opened, so I would have noticed if anyone had entered my room. However, I had no memory of ever hearing the door open. I went to close it and went back to sleep, and a few minutes later, I heard a knock. But it wasn't the usual noise my house makes, like thundering. It was a clear knock twice, as if someone casually wanted to enter. To be honest, I was tired, so I didn't think much of it, and I went back to sleep. In the morning, I asked if anyone had entered or knocked last night, and my family reassured me that it wasn't them. I believed them since they weren't the type to pull off these types of pranks, and they did not believe much in the paranormal. To this day, I still think of what might have been on the other side. I have other stories, if you'd like to hear them. Thank you for reading this. I love your podcast. It is really entertaining. Andy As we come to the end of tonight's episode, I'd like to thank all of you for tuning in and supporting the show. And a special thank you goes out to Aurelie, Sean, Grimmy, and Andy for sharing their experiences. If you've witnessed something paranormal and would like to share your story, please write to me at paranormalmysteriespodcast at gmail.com or by visiting our website at paranormalmysteriespodcast.com. Or if you prefer to record your experience and send it to me, you can now do this on our website as well. You can also visit speakpipe.com slash paranormalmysteries and record your story there. And don't forget that all of our links are in the show notes. Until next time, I hope you all have a great weekend, and we'll see you back here on Monday with our next episode. From all of us at Paranormal Mysteries, thank you for listening, and remember, don't wait for the unknown to come to you. Get out there and find it.